The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, the GOP's Southern strategy from Richard Nixon to Donald Trump, plus former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe on the growing threat of white nationalism in America today, and Bill Press on the story behind the first-ever AIDS ward in the United States. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Terry McAuliffe, who served as the 72nd governor of Virginia from 2014 to 2018. He was chair of the Democratic National Committee from 2001 to 2005, co-chair of President Bill Clinton's 1996 re-election campaign, and the chair of Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. It was during his recent term as governor that the infamous Unite the Right rally took place in Charlottesville and led to the deaths of three people. Dozens more were injured. In his new book, Beyond Charlottesville, Taking a Stand Against White Nationalism, the former governor offers a behind-the-scenes account of that day and his thoughts on what the nation should still be learning. Governor McAuliffe, thank you for joining us today in the America's Democrats podcast. Well, Tim and Sue, great to be with you. Um, It's a book I think everybody will find uh, fascinating, an appropriate time fighting white nationalism, especially what's happened in El Paso. But the book, goes through one of, you know, a really dark period of American history when a thousand neo-Nazis and white supremacists came to Virginia screaming the worst things you have ever heard about members of the Jewish faith, about African Americans. Friday night, they came, hundreds of them came on with their torches, screaming, Jews, you will not replace us. Uh, at night, at 9 o'clock at night, a frightening scene. And then Saturday, just total mayhem uh, when these folks came onto the streets of Charlottesville. I talk about talking to President uh, Trump that day, imploring him to come out and condemn this violence, and he did not. He came out and said there were good people on both sides. So it's, it's an interesting read. John Lewis does the foreword for me, Congressman Lewis, talks about how we got to this place in America. And the last part of the book is, you know, how we go forward, and we have to end this divisiveness and hatred. You mentioned El Paso. Do you see anything in the reaction to El Paso that suggests that America's leaders are waking up? Not yet. I mean, Trump gave a speech the other day, but, you know, just as when I talked to him on the phone the day of Charlottesville, you know, he says all the nice words, but then it's his actions. And, you know, he condemned all the hate speech in America, but, I mean, this is the guy who's the prime hate speech. I mean, in Charlottesville, came, he came out as a full-fledged racist and white nationalist. I don't say that lightly. Um, we needed him at that time. And as you know, he said good people. They were not good people. These people had swastikas and Adolf Hitler shirts. Uh, they ran and down a city street, a white nationalist, and killed 32-year-old Heather Heyer, injured 35 people. And, you know, it's his rhetoric in El Paso, the manifesto, talks about Trump's own tweets of, of white identity and taking America back. And, you know, so, uh, you know, he gave, a, he gave a speech that he read off a teleprompter yesterday. Big deal. That means nothing. How about calling Mitch McConnell back in and saying, let's have a vote on universal background checks this week? How about saying, I apologize for my words. I won't do them again. Let's heal the nation. He didn't do any of that. Do you, do you look at the president acting the way he or reacting the way that he, he did two years ago and, and, and even more recently with his speech the other day? Is this simply a political strategy on his part? <laughs> that is a great question. I have thought... It just doesn't make sense because, you know, by, you know, and going after Elijah Cummings and the squad and, you know, saying to ban Muslims and all Mexicans are rapists and murderers. I mean, it's a consistent pattern. The only thing, if, you, if it's a political strategy, is he must feel that there are a whole group of neo-Nazis and white supremacists 
who did not come out in 2016, who will crawl out from under their rock in 2020. I just don't believe in that strategy. I think anyone who's going to vote for Trump did it. And what he has done is alienate so many Americans. I mean, non-college uh, educated uh, women um, have left him in droves. Independent women have left in droves. So he can't get above 42%. If it is a political strategy, it is a failed strategy. But my point, and I talk about this in the book, you're president of the United States. You have to rise above it. When you took that oath to office, it's your responsibility to represent all Americans. When I got elected governor, I represented the people who voted for me and the people who didn't vote for me. And he just hasn't been able to handle that concept. Mm-hmm. Now, in the book, Governor, you also write about walking a fine line between your hope to defuse violence in Charlottesville and follow the law which allows any group to protest. We're a nation that prizes free speech. At a time when many are choosing to exercise that right with racism and white supremacy, how do we balance their rights with a vision of an inclusive nation? Well, Tim, good question, and I deal a lot with the book because it's important for this country and how we get a handle. Listen, I'm a big supporter of First Amendment, and you have every right to come in to Charlottesville or into Virginia and spew the most vile things you want to say. You do have a right to do that. But you do not have a right to come in to hurt people and to do damage. And I talk about in the book, the city of Charlottesville finally filed an application to move it out of Emancipation Park where the permit was for because it was just too small. There's no way you could have a thousand protesters and a thousand There's no way you could physically do it. So they filed the petition to move it to McIntyre Park because the goal is to keep the protesters separated so they don't clash with one another. And unfortunately, as I talk about in the book, the ACLU sided with the white nationalists and the neo-Nazis and said, no, we're going to uh, fight this permit. We want to keep it where it's at. And then unfortunately, a judge at 9 o'clock at night on a Friday night ruled with the white nationalists and the neo-Nazis. They were wrong. And in fact, several board members from the national ACLU resigned in protest saying, we're for First Amendment, but we're not for speech for neo-Nazis in this country, because it just spews so much hatred. So it's a fine balance. you got to allow anybody to say whatever they want, but if there's a threat of violence, and I talk about in the book, I, for months we had known through our undercover operations with our state police, with the, working with the FBI and the DHS, these people were being told on social media to bring weapons and to hurt people. Well, at that point, the First Amendment protections go away because we can't keep you safe anymore. And that's, that's the balance. And I talk a lot about in the book because, you know, every city and state is going to face these challenges. But you always got to come down and keeping people safe. Mm-hmm. We're speaking with former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe and talking about his new book, Beyond Charlottesville, Taking a Stand Against White Nationalism. Governor, the nation will continue to face many more tests, not only to confront our racist past, but to move forward in ways that undo it. Your book is a call to action. So what kind of action can move us forward? Yep, yep. good question. And I always, what I say, as horrible as Charlottesville was, and it exposed this horrible underbelly of American culture, and it was embarrassing to us around the world. I can't tell you the calls I got from around the world. They were just, what is going on in your country, in your state? And but I do say the one benefit was it did rip off the scab of racism. I think for far too long in our country, people felt that they had dealt with racism. It wasn't an issue. White people are not comfortable talking about this topic. Uh, people were on reconciliation commissions, which I call a total waste of time. It's people sitting around making themselves feel good. The point I make in the book, you've got to do something. You've got to lean in. Uh, you know, as governor of Virginia, as you know, I restored more felon rights than any governor in American history. I got sued by the Republicans, sued for contempt of court, but I won. You know, I took the Confederate flag off of the license plates in Virginia. They, the Confederate symbols are offensive to the African-American community. I pardoned more. But we have an unfair criminal justice system. I pardoned a guy uh, before I left office, Lenny Singleton, a young African-American. He had committed five robberies. He was a drug addict. The total theft was about $535, and nobody was injured. You know what his sentence was, Tim? Take a guess. Oh, man. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. $535. Was... Take a guess. Uh, life. Two life sentences plus 130 years. Unbelievable. Now, unbelievable is right, but this is what happens. And so, you know, we've got to get rid of these mandatory minimum sentences. So my call to action, 
number one, the most important thing is you got to vote. I mean, nobody should be shocked uh, that Donald Trump is in the White House. He won three states by a total of 77,000 votes, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and Pennsylvania. And yet, 92 million Americans did not vote in 2016. And they woke up the next day and said, holy cow, how did this possibly happen? Because they didn't vote. So first call to action is you've got to go out and vote. Uh, these are close elections. He's not going to change himself. He, he is what he is. And uh, he's going to continue his race baiting and his hatred. Uh, it's going to continue. We have to beat him. We have to win control of the United States Senate. And then guess what? In our first two weeks, we'll have universal background checks. We'll have assault weapon ban. We'll have um, high-capacity magazines eliminated. We'll get rid of the gun show loophole. This is real. This can happen. But elected officials got to lean in. they got to quit talking. But until we deal with the inequities in school, and we have it in America, I worked hard as governor in, in Richmond and Petersburg and in Norfolk, to make sure those school districts had the same quality teacher in the same facilities, because in many African-American communities, they don't. That's racism. These children are given a second-class education because people haven't leaned in with the funds necessary to do what you need to do to help these children. We have it in health care. We have it in housing. We have it in criminal justice. So the last part of the book, working with John Lewis, is let's lean in and do something. Quit talking. Do something. And, Governor, that kind of leads me into my, my last question for you. As you look at yep. the Democratic Party today, in the context of our evolving struggle over race in America, what is the unique role Democrats, all Democrats, whether they're in office or they're just everyday citizens, what role can they play in healing this divide? Yeah, it's a hard question. And we need to, it's our language, it's our action, our deeds. So I can say Democratic legislators and, you know, Office holders need to lean in, as I say I did in Virginia on a lot of these uh, issues. You know, I ban the box. I mean, a lot of things you can do that Democrats can do. But most importantly for all of the folks out there, the single most important thing you do is get active in the upcoming elections, knock on doors, make phone calls. The reason I'm optimistic is, you know, with those 77,000 votes, what happened the next year, we had elections in Virginia in 2017, we had the biggest pickup in House of Delegates in 140 years. 18, we won the House of Representatives, big a pickup since 1974. We won seven new governors and got eight new state legislative chambers. People are energized, but we've got to get the Senate back. I mean, look what they're doing with judges. Um, so what we can do is people got to mobilize. This is, uh, we have elections here in Virginia this year. People need to get mobilized. And then next year, I mean, people who have never done it before, you need to get active. You need to be doing the door-to-door. -door. You need to be making the phone call. Our country is at stake. We cannot continue down this path. We're the greatest nation on earth. There's no question about it. We got, you know, issues we have to deal with. But we can't have four more years of Donald Trump in office. We can't. First of all, the world will think we have absolutely gone crazy. They can't understand what happened last time. But, you know, we need to build alliances back. But, you know, we got to give everybody. And that's why I want the Democrats in the debates. I want to hear more talk about lowering prescription drug prices. I want to hear <clears throat> how you deal with out-of-network hospital costs. I want to hear about K-12. I want to hear about infrastructure. We're talking too much about these shiny objects up there, Medicare for all. and People want to hear from us. And please, I would say finally, the last debate, whether you support Joe Biden or don't support Joe, do not attack Joe Biden on Barack Obama's policies. I mean, Barack Obama was a great president. He has a 95% approval rate. And you think this is smart? to attack him on policies of, of President Barack Obama, that to me is a very, very uh, dumb move. And we yep. got to move past it. Let's focus on Trump, and let's focus on real results. Fantastic. The name of the book, Beyond Charlottesville, Taking a Stand Against White Nationalism. Former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Governor, thank you so much for your time. We hope to hear back from you again soon. Thanks. Great to be with you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This 
social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, the lasting impact of the GOP's racist Southern strategy. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. As an old saying puts it, where there's a will, there are a thousand won'ts. Sure enough, here come the won'ts, opposing the public's demand for bold action to stop inequality. The corporate powers are frantically trying to scare the public away from big ideas like Medicare for All, free college tuition, and a wealth tax by branding them with a hoary old right-wing bugaboo, socialism. However, they're facing one huge problem in selling this scare tactic. Such progressive ideas are quite popular. A July poll shows that Senator Elizabeth Warren's idea of a new tax on fortunes greater than $50 million is favored by two-thirds of Americans, including 55% of Republicans. Nearly six out of ten people favor Medicare for all, including a majority of high-income Americans. And nearly 60% of us, including 72% of independent voters, favor free tuition. Ironically, The major barrier to passing such changes is not the one thrown up by big-money lobbyists and Republican Congress creditors. Rather, it's the meekness of establishment Democrats who don't have the courage of their party's Democratic convictions. They whimper that it will be hard to pass the sweeping changes Americans need and want. Plus, those ideas might offend some of the party's big donors. So rather than respond to the grassroots will for real change, These weak-kneed forces are opposing strong advocates like Warren and Bernie Sanders. They say the party should back off from its core values and fighting spirit, urging it instead to offer small, incremental adjustments in the status quo that might win support from some Republicans and corporate chieftains. This is Jim Hightower saying, If the meek ever inherit the earth, these timid do-nothings will be land barons. If Democrats don't stand for the people, why should the people stand for them? If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. The Southern strategy is often understood as a fixed point in American political history when Richard Nixon and the GOP used racism to build a base among white voters in the South. A new book is changing that perspective and deepens our understanding of how the Southern strategy transformed American politics and how its impact persists even today. And we say hello to Angie Maxwell, director of the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society and associate professor of political science and holder of the Diane Blair Endowed Professorship in Southern Studies at the University of Arkansas. She's also the author of The Long Southern Strategy, How Chasing White Voters in the South Changed American Politics. Angie Maxwell, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Why don't we start off by having you kind of remind us first exactly what was the Southern strategy? 
Well, the story that we tell ourselves and the kind of story that we've accepted, I like to call it kind of the short Southern strategy. And that is the idea that starting in the late 1960s, the Republican Party, in the wake of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, decides that a good electoral map strategy would be to try to court Southern white voters by appealing to the racial angst they felt in the wake of that legislation. And so that starts with Goldwater in 64, and Nixon continues that in 68 and 72. And then all of a sudden, the South turns from solidly Democratic blue to Republican red. That's kind of the story we tell, but it's a, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. Well, and the strategy was played out in part uh, through language and what we now call messaging. So what was the message? Sure. Well, Goldwater in 1964 really goes um, direct in his messaging because he had voted against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. When he went on his final tour through the South called Operation Dixie, um, his Southern surrogates, including Strom Thurmond, from Senator from South Carolina, who had just um, flipped his par- his own personal party ID from Democrat to Republican. Um, those surrogates really emphasized that Goldwater had voted against that Civil Rights Act. And so it was a direct appeal to kind of white Southern voters about the overreach of the federal government and the threat to their way of life. But Goldwater only wins, Goldwater wins five deep South states including Mississippi by 87% of the vote, which is just a, a radical, you know, flip from being so solidly Democrat. Um, and he, besides those five deep South states, the only other state he wins is Arizona, his home state. So Nixon's team tweaks this messaging and starts to kind of code the language, right, which is a story a lot of us have heard. Um, And they do appeals to kind of law and order, which translates to a lot of white Southern audiences as an end to civil rights protests, right, and boycotts, um, and and kind of an appeal to move past race, um, as well as um, the war on drugs and kind of criminalizing um, this kind of, or giving a voice to this black threat concept that so many um, white Southerners believed in or um, felt, you know, endangered by um, without directly appealing to that racial animus. A little fear mongering that's not too different from what, yeah, and not too different from what we've been seeing around here lately today. Well, and it's honestly, it's almost gone full circle because now the appeals are very, very overt again, right? But that is because the Republican Party has solidified um, its support in those southern states. Mm -hmm. Now, Angie, policy was also part of the play. What specific policy Mm -hmm. decisions were made to support the strategy? Well, that's a great question. There was pushback um, from the Nixon administration on the enforcement of civil rights um, federal efforts, so they called it benign neglect that Nixon would kind of turn a blind eye to in federal enforcement. That was include that included a backtrack on busing. Um, the other, you know, Nixon tries to appoint some Southern um, judges to the Supreme Court. Those aren't successful, but attempts to do that. That's a direct kind of appeal to the South and their frustrations with the Supreme Court decisions, um, starting with Brown v. Board. And it, It kind of continues into a backlash on affirmative action, quota laws, all of that kind of legislation. In other words, it's it's very much let's just stop going any further. It kind of ends at bookmarks. It truncates like the civil rights achievement. So we're going to pass the legislation, but then we're not going to see a whole lot of federal support for the you know, changes that should come from such legislation. Uh Uh-huh. Now, interestingly, a central piece of your research is that the strategy was much more 
about much more than race. It was also about women and religion. So how did these two mm-hmm. issues play out, and why were they so important? Well, this is really critical because that short Southern strategy kind of story that we tell is, is incomplete. Because in 1976, the South goes right back to right back to the Democratic Party when Jimmy Carter runs. It's going gonna, it's gonna to also have about five or six Southern states that are going to swing back to Bill Clinton in the 1990s. So each time this happens, the Republican Party really debates. And this is a true fight within their party about is this strategy of appealing to white Southerners, is that electoral map path, is that the right path? And coming up on the 1980 election, you know, Reagan's team polls um, extensively um, American women and realizes that the anti-ERA spirit is, you know, dominating among Southern white women. So Republican establishment leaders had seen that rising up under Phyllis Schlafly's direction. And they see, you know, 20,000, you know, white women show up in Houston for a family values rally to kind of um, try to stop the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. And so in 1980, they dropped the ERA from their platform. The Republican Party did. They'd had it continuously in there for almost 40 years, and they drop it. And they really kind of push traditional gender roles in an effort to kind of win not only Southern white men, but a whole lot of Southern white women that agree. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, in, I mean, it starts, some of these kind of overlap. It really starts in the 80s, but it goes all the way into um, George W. Bush's administration is a a push to win over evangelical, you know, Christian voters um, to appeal to them, to meet with their leaders extensively, to bring them into the campaign, to push their issues, including putting gay marriage amendments on the ballot, challenging, you know, extreme abortion laws or anti-abortion laws. Um, in order to kind of pull those voters in and solidify, which they also knew was such a big pocket of that Southern white vote that they were adamant that they needed. We're speaking with Angie Maxwell, director of the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society and associate professor of political science at University of Arkansas, also the author of The Long Southern Strategy, How Chasing White Voters in the South Changed American Politics. Angie, another key theme in your work is the long tail of the Southern strategy. It, it, it achieved its short-term goal, but its impact went far beyond that. What are some of the most significant ways it reshaped politics over time? Well, that is a great question. I mean, in addition, and this is what kind of, I think we really still see today. In addition to the policy positions, these forks in the road where Republicans take such a right turn to win these white Southern voters, they also... They also did it in a Southern style. So by that, I mean what had been common to Southern politics for so long, since it was kind of a one party system, was not a politics of real um, policy debate, but one of entertainment, right? The big rallies, demagoguery, large chants, kind of almost like a tent revival type politics, a pitting of us versus them. A real attacks on the media, which had been longstanding tradition in Southern politics, right? All of those, this politics of vengeance, this victimization politics, you know, and and also something that um, people who study George Wallace called positive polarization, which is instead of appealing to people based on who you are as a candidate, you describe who you're not. So you, you want to be on my team because you don't want to be one of them. And that style has, you know, which, of course, Democrats have responded to, too, has really polarized the electorate. From the Southern Baptist Convention, they really pick up this pitch about absolutism. So you can't be a little bit of a biblical literalist. You either are or you aren't. And those kinds of that kind of dynamic in their messaging has really has really changed it for all of us 
I mean, the Republican Party doesn't just kind of go south. They really become southern and they drag the rest of the country with them because there are pockets of all of this all over the country. Right. And so it's a southern strategy that has a big national impact. Now, in a piece in the Washington Post, you make the point that the Southern strategy is still working today. How does it still define GOP politics in the South? Well, that's a great question. I I remember um, right before the Republican primaries, um, they call it, you know, the SEC primary when all the Southern states are on the same day, or most of them. Um, I remember a reporter asking me, who I thought would win. And I said, Trump, and they just couldn't believe that. It's, it, you know, he's the New York, you know, wealthy, you know, n- no real religious personal history that we knew about. I said, but he's playing these three things. He's playing this kind of white victimization and, you know, racial resentment. He's really hitting what we measure in the book called modern sexism, which is a resentment and a distrust of working women. Um, And he's playing towards this kind of evangelical Christian nationalism. And those three things are held by people outside of the South, too, but they are in dense concentration in the region. And it turns out that among his white voters, um, you know, holding one of those attitudes or two or all three, which is actually a small group of people, accounts for 95 percent of his white vote. Ninety five percent. Wow. Wow. Is it too much of a stretch to say that without the Southern strategy, we may not have had a Trump presidency? I don't think that's a stretch at all. I mean, there are a lot of um, I mean, the fact that the Republican Party does winner, you know, winner take all primaries, you know, it allow. And the fact, there were so many candidates running in 2016. I mean, it allows Trump to hit that, you know, 30 to 35 percent kind of faction and have that dominate. So that's a factor, too. But at the same time, you know, you can win more white Southern voters by going to the hard right. And when that is your base, those Southern states are really just critical to the Republican map. I mean, there isn't there isn't a path without them. Right. Mm -hmm. If you lose a few, there's no path. So playing to that end to get that solid base. Right. And whoever will do it. I mean, think about the Republican politicians who haven't done that as much. You know, Romney didn't play that as hard. John McCain didn't play that as hard. Bob Dole didn't play that as hard. And they all lost. Right. And so it has it has reinforced that that's what has to happen. It's also the same people who runs Ronald Reagan's southern campaign. Paul Manafort, who helps make the Willie Horton ad um, against Dukakis in 88. Roger Ailes, right? It's some of the same groups of people dividing and really pressing on fear and resentment and victimization. Um, and it didn't have to be that way. You know, there's a whole lot of things you could appeal to about Southern culture that aren't the worst aspects of it. Um, but that wasn't the choice that was made. There are a lot of things about Southern culture that I love. And, Me too. And, 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 and none of it is anything that we're talking about today. Uh, it's, it's just it's absolutely co- not. Yeah. I mean, it's really kind of sad. It's sad because these issues didn't have to be partisan. You know, civil right. rights could have, we could have, both parties could have been pro civil rights. So we could have just debated, like, how do we get there? What policy is the best? Didn't have to be one or the other. And one that has lasted and continues. Uh-huh. That's that's the uh-huh. other shocking thing to me. Um, before we let you go, if you were to speak to Democrats, especially progressive Democrats in the South, what could you sure. tell them about how to break this bond that has been forged with the GOP over the past 50 years? Well, a couple of things. One it's to, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, we can't change what we don't acknowledge. So we have to have good information. So, you know, 75 percent of white women would not vote for Stacey Abrams in her governor's race in Georgia. We have to know that we have to build the right coalitions. Right. Mm-hmm. Second thing is that it's going to take a long time in some places. I mean, it did. This didn't happen overnight. So right. the infrastructure that was built built in Texas 
during Beto O'Rourke's campaign, in Florida under Andrew Gillum's campaign, what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia, that will pay dividends if there's always somebody running, always somebody organizing. I mean, that infrastructure is absolutely critical, and it will pay off if, if, it's, if it's seen as a long game, right? And the third thing is, you know, politics is local. It, it really still is. That's why you see people like Bullock in Montana able to win in a red state because of a low population and an ability to really reach, you know, individual voters in kind of a one-on-one or in close, you know, community networks. That's still crucial, but that takes infrastructure, right? Particularly in our populous populous states. And of course, still our voter turnout in this country. You know, there are more, you know, non-voters that we could bring in um, into the Democratic Party um, with progressives um, that would counter these changes. And voting third party, you know, I mean, voting third, there were, in 2016 election, there were 13 states, 13, where the, the number of people who voted third party, you know, is larger than the difference between the two candidates who won and who lost. That counts for 155 electoral votes, 155, wow. right? So it's being strategic and smart, even though we may hate a two-party system, I understand, but, but realistic, pragmatic, local politics, long game. Absolutely. Angie Maxwell, director of the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society and associate professor of political science and holder of the Diane Blair Endowed Professorship in Southern Studies at the University of Arkansas. Also the author of The Long Southern Strategy, How Chasing White Voters in the South Changed American Politics. Angie, thank you so much for your time with us today on the America's Democrats podcast. We'd love to have you back again soon. Anytime. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats on the air and help elect stand up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now the transformation of how doctors treated AIDS patients, from fear and ignorance to compassion and dignity. Bill Press talks with Cliff Morrison about the new documentary, 5B. You land in San Francisco. In San Francisco and Castro, it was, what was it like in those days? Pretty wild, huh? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I couldn't wait to get out of the panhandle of Florida. <laughs> um, you know, I stood out like a sore thumb, uh, although I did, I did well. I was a farm boy. I worked in a little town and, uh, you know, got, uh, didn't like working in the field, so managed to get myself to, to working in a hospital, first mopping the floors mm. and then becoming an orderly. Um, and, and so that was my out, and no one in my family had been to co- had graduated from high school, high school, or been to college. So, so that was my out. By the age of ten, I was like, "I'm getting out of here." Went to Jacksonville, found myself in Miami, and thought, "Wow, I've arrived right there with disco." <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, and then Anita Bryant came along, and luckily, I'd had a good friend in high school uh, in a college from uh, San Francisco. And had been visiting there for a number of years and would always go into summer when it was so much cooler. And uh, just uh, one day, uh, you know, got this offer for a part-time, uh, you know, a, a short-term one-year gig to work on a project at UCSF and San Francisco General. And would I like to work on it? And I said, sure, you know, mm. thinking, mm. you know, I'll do a year. I'll get it out of my system. I'll go back to Miami. Miami's home. Uh, but 40 years later, I'm still in the Bay Area. And the, the the documentary, which we'll talk about uh, after some initial scenes of you in the abandoned uh, ward at uh, San Francisco General, shows a, a lot of the night scene at uh, the Castro, which yeah. was in, was pretty lively at the time. It was, and then suddenly there was a dark cloud that came over it. Mm-hmm. W- when did that happen, and what did you see? 
Because I, I had spent time in San Francisco and, and literally moved, I didn't move right into the Castro. I lived in the neighborhood next to the Castro and then above the Castro and uh, <clears throat> for 20 years. But um, uh, certainly enjoyed being there. Always, uh, you know, I was in my middle 20s then and, and uh, I was always energized by it. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of good friends there. Even before the first inkling of HIV and AIDS, I, I remember thinking to myself, this is almost too good to be true. Something, this bubble's going to burst. There's too much politics around this. There's too, you know, mm. I'm here in San Francisco and it feels like the safe place to be, but uh, I'm not sure about the rest of the country. I'm not sure about what the future holds for us. I I, 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 underneath it all, I think I was always just a little bit vigilant. My roommate at the time said that I was downright paranoid and was always looking for things. So, <laughs> so then, um, as a nurse, patients started coming in with this disease or this illness that nobody knew what it was. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we started seeing them at San Francisco General. Uh, I've got to say a lot during these interviews that the first case, looking back on it, that I dealt with was my roommate, a um, good friend from Miami who followed me out six months later and just needed a place to live for a while. We were just good friends and started working at San Francisco General, but didn't have benefits or anything. And he was younger than me. And I was always the steady person. I was always the one who went to work and was responsible. And... Uh, uh, he was always out partying, and, and I used to say to him, you know, there's all this partying out here, but, you know, we've got to use a little discretion here. This is, you can't live this way. Uh, we're not going to be young forever. And I came home from work one, one late one afternoon, and he was laying in the hallway, uh, you know, mm. barely breathing, barely conscious. And uh, so I scooped him up, put him in bed, started taking care of him, and he was delirious, no health care insurance. Contacted a doctor friend of mine who said, yeah, you know, I've seen something like this. Bring him over to the office first thing in the morning. And they immediately admitted him to one of the local hospitals and immediately isolated him. I'd never seen isolation like it. And they immediately said to me, you've got to put on all this stuff. And I said, listen, I've been taking care of this guy for two days. Um, you know, I've had him in my bed. I've bathed him. I've, you know, I've done everything. I've uh, been his nurse. Come on. You know, if he's, you know, if, if he's that contagious, whatever he's got, I've got. So that's when I started, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not buying all this other bullshit. I'm not doing that. And then um, you saw there were more patients that came in like that. Uh, and then um, as the documentary now, 5B, which uh, is, will be up, hopefully nominated for an Academy Award this year, soon to be released uh, nationwide, um, all about your efforts, successful efforts with the help of a lot of friends, to found a special ward at San Francisco General to deal with what became known as AIDS patients. Um, here is a little touch of a 5B. Let's listen to a little bit of the trailer about what the movie is all about. The 70s were about that attempt that we made to carve out a place for ourselves in society that had never been done before. It is a big deal. 1981 was when things really began to change. We had patients that came through with this illness. Within a month or two, boom, he was gone. Nearly 3,000 cases of AIDS have already hit this city. Nobody even knew how it was uh, spread. They wanted to quarantine us on an island. I had seen patients being marginalized, and I just found it infuriating. We were expected to wear what we called spacesuits, and some would refuse to give care. We have to do something. At San Francisco General Hospital, the staff is gearing up for the opening of a special wing to treat AIDS victims. The nurses there physically built that ward. They made the rules as they went along. <laughs> I don't want nobody here to give up. And I don't think that they will. I saw what a toll it was taking on us. I was drinking more every night. I remember having recurrent nightmares. We were being attacked on all fronts, politically, medically. There was a guy who had applied for insurance, and they couldn't ask him if he was gay. 
So they said, have you ever worked as a florist, a hairdresser, or a decorator? There were still nurses operating from fear. They went to the union. We don't want to take care of these people. I might have some anxiety about this, but I'm more pissed off and angry than I am scared. Why not bring life and laughter and joy? This was a tangible thing you could do. It's just part of nursing. They stood up when nobody else would, and they were willing to take those risks. And they're all kind of kick-ass, even the straight ones. They're getting the trailer from 5bfilm.com, available as of August 27, nationwide, at 5bfilm.com. Believe me, it's a very, very powerful documentary. Well worth your time. It's an hour 34, uh, perfect length as far as I'm concerned, and well worth your time. So check it out. So, Cliff, you're a junior nurse, <laughs> uh, strapping young man there. And how did you manage to get the, the leadership of the hospital to give you like your, an entire ward to set up care for these AIDS patients the way you want to do it? Um. Very interesting question, but but uh, you know it, there was a lot involved. Uh, first of all, I looked like a junior nurse, uh, and a lot of people thought I was ten years younger than I was. Uh, but I had already been a nurse for over ten years at that mm-hmm. point, and uh, I had already held responsible positions. I already had two master's degrees. I would already been hmm. uh, in management. I'd already been an administrator. I'd already been teaching. So I came with credentials. It's one of the reasons you see wanted me there. Right. And so early on, I, you know, I found myself in kind of this advisory role. I was advising on, I came from Miami during hurricanes. At that time, San Francisco General hadn't yet developed an earthquake strategy disaster plan for the hospital. And so uh, one of the administrators said, you've worked on this stuff. You actually put a hospital through, through Mm -hmm. um, a hurricane. And I was like, yeah. So, so they started putting me in all these committees and I started consulting on all sorts of things and kind of what happens, I think, in most industries, you know, you, you kind of yep. build your reputation, mm-hmm. you know, by doing that. And that's what happened for me. Uh, so by the time the first cases came along, and uh, uh, because I was a medical clinical nurse specialist, they were calling me, but primarily they called me because uh, I accidentally had to, had attended a CE seminar, continuing education seminar at the hospital on sexuality. At the end of it, this nurse was talking about that she had started this KS clinic with University of California, and they were working with these patients, and there was this group in the community, and it was going to become a big deal, and I raised my hand and said, we're already seeing them. Mm. At the end of it, I went up and spoke with her, and she gave me information about how to become involved and how to become a Shanti volunteer. So how did you, how are these patients treated in other hospitals or other wards and what did you do differently in 5b at at that point in time people were treated pretty badly everywhere uh any any hospital that was seeing aids patients first of all they all wanted to send them to their county hospitals uh you know or to a teaching hospital to get them away because no one knew what to do uh their care was abysmal uh they were often neglected uh, meals were left outside doors, uh, you know, big signs were posted on doors, um, you know, infectious disease, you know, big red, almost flashing kinds of signs. Uh, visitors weren't allowed. Uh, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty bad. I was, I was, the first time I saw it, I was totally appalled and said, this, this cannot happen. We can't do this. Uh, visitors or nurses had to wear spacesuits if they went in, but most of them wouldn't even go in. Most people would stand at the door. Even visitors would stand at the door. And you say in the documentary, people need human contact. Yes. So that that was sort of your mission. That was my whole thing. It's it's you know if we can't cure these people, we're going to touch them. Um, you know that's basic human nature. Um, I'm, I'm in a helping, caring profession. That's what we do. When people, when people are in distress, I hold them. And, you know, that's the most powerful thing in the world you can do is to put your hand on the hand of someone else and say, I'm here, I'm here for you to cradle them in your arms when they're in pain or or when they feel like that, 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 you know, life is 
slipping away and they're in total despair. What what more human thing can any of us do? I'm, I I don't want to sound you know like 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 Mother Teresa, but <laughs> but I felt like it. And it was a real difference for these people, as you can see in the documentary. It was. They they immediately responded. And the, so, uh, as someone there says that our mission is not to cure; our mission is to care. Yes. That doesn't sound so revolutionary, but it was. It was at the time, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, healthcare medicine was going through a major change at the, you know at that particular point in time. Um, you know, we were still embracing the medical model. We still do to a great extent in this country. The rest of the world doesn't. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the medical model except the way that in this country, the way it's practiced and the way it's set up. And you focus just on the medical model, you miss so much more. It's all about caring. It's all about prevention. It's all about all the other alternative things that you can do to support people. How many people are we talking about? Today? In your in those days. Oh, in those days? In the- in the ward, how many uh, patients? Uh, hundreds, hundreds. Uh, by the time by the time the unit opened, there were literally hundreds, uh, maybe even thousands, of people living with AIDS in San Francisco You're at that time. Nineteen eighty one. Well, we opened the unit in July, July twenty fifth, <laughs> anniversary next week, um, um, nineteen eighty three. Nineteen eighty three. Did any of them survive? Yes, interestingly enough, one of my closest friends now, who was never never a patient on the unit, he actually spent time on the unit with me, and did did some volunteer work there and worked with me later on conferences and stuff. Um, and um, uh, Michael was probably one of the first people that was diagnosed with AIDS before they knew what it was. He was an officer in the military, and the military didn't know what to do with him, so they just gave him full retirement and put him out. <clears throat> So uh, he was one of those people. He lucked up. He's lived well. He's in his middle 70s. Uh, he's, you know, he's got enough money to live on comfortably, and he's still kicking, and I see him all the time. He's a rare exception. He's a rare exception. I mean, we now was- know that he was one of those one of those that probably had partial uh, immunity, uh, was a non-progressor for many years. For almost everyone who came in, it was a death sentence. It was a death sentence. You did not expect them to. No one expected to live. I mean, everybody said, I'm going to beat this, but we knew. We knew. I mean, we were focused on this was a, this was a geared up approach to hospice. We worked closely with hospice. I totally believed in their philosophy. Welcome the men, work with them, and Shanti. Um, but, but we knew that we were looking at terminal end of life care, and what we wanted to do was to be able to provide the best quality. And, and care and to make people as comfortable as possible around the people that they loved and the things that they loved. Uh, in the documentary, again, it's 5bfilm.com, um, you uh, play a principal role in talking about the founding of the the, the ward and the work there. Um, you had some help from some extraordinary people. One of them, Alison Moed. She yes. was the Managing nurse, I believe, right? Yeah, Allison. Allison was Allison Tell us was about one her of the. <clears throat> Allison was one of the original twelve nurses that I hired. One of the things I'm going to try to do as this film gets re-released now to go to go streaming, is to have them put an addendum on the end about the 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 group of original nurses and the five that have died since then. I want them memorialized. Uh, Allison was one of the first nurses that I hired. I met her working there in the hospital. We we were totally simpatico. You can tell that in the film. Uh, she became my chief ally. We worked t- together very closely. And when I was promoted, I made her the head nurse of the unit. I was never a head nurse. I was always the AIDS coordinator. But at some point, because I began to run the whole medical division of the hospital, I had to have somebody to run that unit specifically, so I made her the head nurse. Very courageous, uh, her role comes across in the documentary. And then um, there was, I don't believe she was a nurse, but a woman by the name of Rita Rocket. Rita Rocket, what yes. Was, what was her contribution? <clears throat> Rita Rocket's this wonderful, vivacious, uh, she's still around, she's done some traveling with us. Uh, she lives in Ohio, uh, but she was just a fixture in the Castro, just one of those 
you know, the 1980s, uh, San Francisco was filled with characters. I lived, you know, just down the road from Sylvester, mm -hmm. who'd come flying by on his motorcycle, you know, with the flowing um, uh, robes and the scarves and everything. And Rita Rocket was this um, uh, travel agent, restaurant worker, food server, whatever. And she lived in she lived in the Castro and loved gay boys and loved the bars. And she started doing these entertainment things just to raise money for events or whatever. And then she adopted 5B. And then she started doing brunches every other Sunday. Uh, she contacted Allison and Allison said, come on in. When I met her, I was like, by that time we were using community stuff. I mean, we took everything that we could get and we were fortunate. I mean, uh, it was one of the reasons that people really, a lot of people didn't like what we were doing. They were like, you've made this look like a party over here. All these people are getting things that nobody else has gotten. Well, they had nothing. So, so it was wonderful to me and for the rest of us to see the community want to give us so much. And Rita was right there yeah. and she was bigger than life and she's wonderful. But not everybody was right there. Not even not all it. the nurses were right there. No, right? they weren't. So some of the nurses really felt threatened and um, tried to stop you and tried to force everyone to wear the mask and gloves and, and all of that and keep visitors out. Um, and that was a battle you had to fight. Yes, it was a tough one. I thought we were going to lose. Um, but I'm a very tenacious person. And when I look back on it, when I was younger, I just, <clears throat> no wasn't in my vocabulary. I just didn't accept that. I just, I stayed focused. I stayed focused. One of the things that I think comes across very clearly in that film is, if you notice, I was always focused. Um, I never deviated. People only saw a part of me, and it was a very manufactured part. The whole image, the way that I behaved, the way uh, things that I said, I was very, very careful what I said to the media. I stayed out of controversy as much as I could. I just stayed focused on exactly what I was doing, and that worked. But, but they took you to the State Department of Labor, to the Labor Board. Yes. Right, to challenge what you were doing. Yes, they wanted and me gone. Force, <laughs> right, and to force you to change. Yes. And they lost. And they lost. I didn't think they would. I just, I, I just didn't, I just didn't think that 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 we had the kind of support. I knew that we did within the community. I just didn't think that within the legal bureaucracy, within the courts, within uh, the political bureaucracies, that there was enough support at that time because we were still early into it. So there was this group of nurses, and they lost. Um, and you did have this loyal group of of nurses that worked with you. I mean, the nurses. Are the real heroes? They're the heroes, yeah, definitely, the and the volunteers. God, we had so yeah. many volunteers, and the Shanti people. Shanti, Shanti wasn't in the film, just in passing, but but uh, uh, we could have never we could have never done any of this without Shanti in hospice, uh, and and all the other volunteer groups that and there were just numbers and numbers of them. I mean, people in, in groups that I can't remember their name. At the same time. You were fighting some, um, also in addition to these nurses, um, some pretty formidable foes in the political world. Yes. Uh, let's talk about a couple of them. Um, I would say you, you probably believe that President Ronald Reagan was not your friend at the time? No, he wasn't my friend, and he knew of me, and, and, and he didn't like me. So he, he, you know, let's keep all that out there. Let's, you know, we're not going to deal with this. I mean, he said... That, uh, that, that he would ban people who were HIV positive from coming into the country. Uh, he suggested that the people with HIV be quarantined. Yes. Um, sent to an island, maybe, mm -hmm. for themselves. Sounds uh, familiar, doesn't it? Years, years went by before he even mentioned the word AIDS. Uh, I know uh, Hank Plant, uh, who was a reporter in San Francisco at the time, covering this issue, you, you work closely with him, Yes, um, pointed out, I believe in the documentary, that by the time Ronald Reagan did say the word AIDS, 21,000 Americans had died. Yes, at it. least. Mm -hmm. Right. So you had that opposition or indifference at the federal level. Uh, also at the federal level, uh, Congressman William Dannemeyer mm -hmm. from Orange County. Yes. 
Uh, and how did you counter that? I mean, he was out there um, not just against the work you were doing, mm-hmm. but outright homophobic, you know, homosexual is wrong, homosexuality is wrong, it's unchristian, it's un-American, boom, boom, boom. He was. He was after everybody. He specifically targeted me because I was an easy target. Uh, I mean, it's part of the reason that I was the focal point. The system, we'd never done with things. We'd never dealt with it with what we were dealing with. So I kind of symbolized it. I was, I was the sacrificial lamb. I knew it. I put myself out there to do it. Powers that be were willing to let me do it because if it failed, they had somebody to blame. If somebody got shot, it could be me. Everybody else could keep their hands clean. I took all the responsibility. I did that willingly. Nobody, you know, nobody hoodwinked me. I knew exactly what I was doing. So I was an easy, easy target. And Dana Meyer went for me. And he, his goal was, you know, I'll, I, I will tear this kid down right away. And then it'll be easy to just do everything else. So we can dismantle it. You've got the president of the United States against you. You've got the leading California congressman against you. How about the mayor of San Francisco? Diane Feinstein is just the most wonderful person in the world. I always wish she'd run for president. Um, Diane Feinstein's tough as nails. I mean, anybody who knows Diane Feinstein knows she's tough as nails. I had worked with her before this. I'd been, I had, I'd been a clinical nurse specialist. I'd been on the negotiating team for for union contracts, and I remember men holding themselves when they walk into the room dealing with her. Diane holds her own. Um, Did she support you? Did she help? She not only supported, I remember sitting in a room with her and with Dr. Merv Silverman, who was director of public health, and he arranged the meeting, the three of us, <clears throat> and she turned to him and she said, Merv, what do we do? I've got a surplus this year and we can spend the money on this. Tell me what we need and we'll do it. He told her and she said, do it. And I'll support whatever it is that you and Cliff want to do. And... You know, I walked out of that room, and I remember I said to him, I said, I will follow her for the rest of her life, and I would vote for her. I don't care what she runs for. I hope she's going to be the first female president. I think she would have made a great one. But, yeah, I absolutely, absolutely have nothing but respect for Dianne Feinstein. She, she was one of those politicians that didn't hold back, that put it out there when things didn't, you know, when – when nobody really knew what we were doing, she didn't hesitate. That's what that's what a leadership. That's what leadership is all about. Bill Press talking with Cliff Morrison about the new documentary 5B. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressShow.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Terry McAuliffe, Angie Maxwell, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.